Thanks, Debbie. It's, uh, hello, everyone. It's good to see you guys uh, again. And uh, so today uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about, about the uh, sort of a strategic way to uh, implement the 20 critical uh, security controls. And um, I'm also going to be bouncing in and out of this uh, uh, slide deck to uh, show you some examples and give you some resources uh, where you can download some of the uh, tools and, and uh, uh, kits that we use. Uh, and um, again, most of these are open source. Uh, in fact, I think all of them are. Uh, also show you some of our policies and uh, we're a public institution, so you feel free to download those. Um, and if you want, uh, change Virginia Tech to whatever your organization name is and, and go for it. Uh, my only request to you is that if you do change a, a, a policy or add something to it, uh, send me the changes because I, I, I might incorporate them into our policy structure here. So um, let's go ahead and start. Um, again, uh, one of the projects, I always like to start with this one, most of my presentations in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, back in 2001, uh, uh, one of the SANS projects I worked on was uh, one where we surveyed uh, the internet community at the time. And we said, uh, we were asking them, what are the most common security mistakes that were made by individuals? So I want you to take a look at this slide and uh, you know you can either do thumbs up, thumbs down on the chat window, whatever you want to do. But my question to you is, have we fixed any one of these? So again, poor password management, leaving your computer on unattended, email attachments from strangers, not installing antivirus software, laptops on the loose is that uh, uh, basically we you left a laptop in a public place. Uh, blabber mounts, again, they're sort of file access uh, or folder access or directory access to the world. Uh, plug and play without protection, not reporting security violations, uh, always behind the times and patches, and, and just looking for stuff that's inside your organization. Um, when I do this talk uh, live in front of people, I always hear that nervous laughter where people kind of look at it and, uh, um, but, uh, and then, you know, what have we been doing in the last 18 years that we have not been able to fix more than one of these? I, I checked off not installing antivirus software uh, because with systems like Microsoft and uh, Windows and that, uh, you know, uh, AV software is now sort of incorporated in the, in the OS uh, installs. But there is a distinction between installing the software and running the software. So I, I wanted to kind of, again, this is sort of to make you think about why we're doing this stuff with the controls um, and, and see what's going on. I mean, it's, it is stunning. We put a man on the moon in 10 years and in 18 years, we haven't been able to, to get rid of this list. So uh, on that happy note, let's go on to the, the next one. Uh, people always say that universities are different from corporate. Oh, you guys don't know what's going on or you don't know what our problems are. I said, yes, we do, because we are a corporation. We're just in a different sector. Um, and and uh, ironically, uh, as we move to more mobile environments, and I'll talk a little bit more about this further down, as we move to more mobile environments, we're finding that the corporate uh, networks are starting to become more and more like the edu networks. We have three main business processes. And I bring this up because I'm going to uh, use this to sort of tie in where we apply the controls. Uh, uh, the critical control. So we have the administrative part, that's HR, that's payroll, that's everything that, that runs the business uh, uh, in there. And, and that security model is kind of close to the corporate one. We, we restrict access, we try to you know, log stuff that's going on with the applications and things like that. And that's the closest to that. We're, our business is academia and instruction, so that's our, that's our main business process. That's the second business process you see. Uh, BYOD for us is nothing new. We've been doing it since 1984. So uh, again, we learned a long time ago that it's not so much the device, it's the data on the device that really counts. And again, this, this will influence uh, what, how we approach the, the critical controls. But uh, BYOD for us, uh, we've been requiring students at Virginia Tech to purchase a computer uh, since 1984. And that means basically there are some of the controls that we can, can and can't apply. Uh, on them because we don't own the assets. Um, and so our security model there is pretty close to that of an ISP. 
And this is where I see we're going in the corporate structure and the edu structure in the next five years. We are basically going to become ISPs, and I'll explain that a little bit later on. We're a research university, so our third business process is a hybrid of the previous two. And so the security model there is a hybrid of the previous two. So these are, you know, so my, I, I point this out because one of the first things that you want to address when you're looking at your institution and, and implementing the 20 critical uh, security controls is, what are my business processes? What are the ones that, that count? Which are the ones that I, I can hold off for, for later? So understanding what those business processes are uh, is, is an important step in implementing the controls. The other thing to, to uh, consider is really what are the hacker tools? Uh, I've been doing uh, cybersecurity stuff since 1991 when uh, one of my servers got hacked way back then. And over the, the past, you know, almost 30 years, um, when you look at the attacks that we've seen both locally at Virginia Tech and working with uh, projects from SANS and other uh, external groups, uh, the hackers really have only do one of these three things. They're either after the data, uh, of what whatever data it is, uh, financial, uh, personal, whatever. They either go after the data, and we call those data breaches. They use your assets to attack other sites. Uh, this is the attribution problem that we always talk about. Um, and people always said the universities are the source of attacks. Well, no, commercial sites attack us, use our assets to attack other sites. That's the way it used to be. Um, and then, you know, uh, if once you're done with the other two, uh, then maybe I'm just going to destroy uh, data logs or whatever at the, at the company. It's one of those three things. And so why aren't we designing our defenses to address those three uh, attack vectors first? And again, this is where the controls will help us out. So it comes down to what is it we're defending? Well, in the old days, when we first started off with this in the early 90s, uh, uh, everybody thought, oh, we need to protect systems. It's the systems that count. We need to protect that type of stuff. Well, yeah, th that's not really the case when it comes to it. A as a CISO, uh, there is a, a, there's a distinction between a device breach and a data breach. And so, uh, you know, we, we started off protecting systems because that's what we thought we, we needed to do. So then we moved to the networks because that's the easy thing. That's the firewall infrastructure and things like that. And uh, uh, those of you that know me, uh, I do not think firewalls are uh, very good protection devices. I think they are extremely effective detection devices. Uh, and there is a distinction between the two, but we use networks. Wireless has kind of changed the rules on that. We're 100% wireless here. So while I want to defend, I need to push those out more to the endpoint. And we always have assumed that the networks are hostile. And so it really is data is what we should be defending. And let me repeat again, data is what we should be defending. So knowing where your high risk data is, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more into that uh, shortly, um, but knowing where that is, we want to be able to uh, uh, find the data, sensitive data, make sure it's where it's supposed to be, and then make sure that we can have ways to track the data as it moves around our network, but more importantly, as it leaves our network. Should it be leaving our network? And if it does, uh, if it should be, is it going to only certain uh, uh, sites? So this is what we're supposed to be doing. Um, Matt Mann uh, uh, has a hierarchy of incident response. This is a table uh, 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 diagram that he drew uh, in the speaker notes. Um, for this slide, I, I put the reference to the GitHub site where you can download this. But really, when you look at these things from the bottom up, from inventory all the way to act, each one of these layers that he's got in this diagram you really have a, a set of controls, of critical controls that can help you address uh, your response at this level. So we start down at the very bottom, right? Do you, can you name the assets you're defending? Do you know where they are? Do you know who the, not only uh, where they are and what they are, but who's the person responsible for those, for those um, assets? Telemetry, do you have visibility across your entire network? Uh, we run into this where departments sometimes they don't want us to scan their stuff, so they firewall off our machines to keep us from scanning them. And they basically, um, they basically uh, sit down and and uh, you know we say, well, why are you blocking us and not blocking the real people who are threatening you? Detection: Can you detect any uh, unauthorized activity? 
Do you know what your normal profile baseline traffic is supposed to be? Um, and then once you see something odd, how fast does it take you to classify it uh, as a threat? How, how long does it take you to identify uh, who the adversaries are and, and perhaps what their capabilities are? Um, you know, what's anomalous behavior inside uh, your network? Uh, certain users always log in at a certain hour and they always go to these machines. And then you see a login for that person out of band, like at three or four in the morning. And they're not going to a, a university asset. They're going to some site in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, can you hunt for those adversaries that you, that you find that are already inside your net? This goes back to zero trust networks, where you assume the network is hostile and you assume that they're already inside your network. Can you track them? And then uh, last but not least, can you act to uh, uh, cut them off? and, and uh, you know, get them out of your net. So I'd like to show this diagram as a strategic way to, to help you figure out which controls to use, but also to show uh, you and auditors, uh, you know, how, what your overall strategy is with that. So the basic plan that, that we adopted here is what most of you have. I, I teach the five-day version of this class, uh, SEC 566, and the two-day version of this class, SEC 440. And we always kind of start off with, okay, we have a high level, I call it fluffy bunny standard, you know, uh, ISO 27001, NIST 853, whatever it is, uh, any of the international standards. And so we start off with that. And then from the, from the framework, uh, which is very high level stuff to more specific stuff in the, in the standards like 853. And then we want to take it one step further from the standards and map it to a critical control. And then we want to actually take those controls and, and the defenses listed in the controls, and we actually want, want to come out with a set of commands that actually do whatever it is we need to do. And so one of the, the methods that I, I propose and, and, uh, that you consider is to use the CIS benchmarks as that final step. So I'm going to jump out of this uh, uh, um, uh, slide deck real quick. I'm going to go to this uh, website that's here, auditscripts.com. James Tarala, who is the, um, who's the uh, author of the, the SEC 566 and 440 courses, uh, this is his website, auditscripts.com. If we come over to free resources, and you'll see critical security controls, and if you click on that, um, you'll, you'll uh, get to uh, a site where you have a lot of the documentation. Here are the 20 critical controls, version one. If we scroll down, we can actually get the control document, which is this PDF. And there are three spreadsheets that are extremely useful uh, for you to use. Um, there's an, uh, uh, an executive assessment uh, thing. This is kind of like an executive summary. Uh, we have uh, a gap analysis tool, which is this assessment tool. But the one I want to show you at the moment is this one. This is the master mapping uh, spreadsheet. So um, if I open this uh, uh, puppy up, um, and once I've downloaded it, um, and then uh, come over here and um, let's see, here, here we go. Uh, let me see if I can blow this up just a hair. Um, thank you, come over here, let me kill this one and get the other one. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm going to, uh, let's see, where is my little expander? It's here somewhere. Um, so I'm just going to increase the font size a little bit, uh, kind of stretch it out there, uh, and hopefully uh, you should be able to see it. So here, what we've done is over the years that we've taught the SANS class, uh, we've asked has students to send us uh, standards and frameworks that, that they uh, use uh, in their environment. And then this uh, spreadsheet that James created, it takes a control, for instance, um, control number one, inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices, okay? And then as we move down through the columns, here are the NIST 853 Rev 4 uh, sections that this control addresses. Here's the NIST uh, uh, cybersecurity framework that uh, gives you the, the um, uh, uh, components of that. Here we have version 1.1. One, one. Here we have NIST 800-82, the SMB guide from NIST, DHS is a CDM program, ISO 27002. So like for us, 
Our security strategy is based on ISO 27002. Control one addresses those three sections of the, of the ISO framework. Uh, we have 2013, 2702, 2005. We have an IEC. We have the NIST 800-171, controlled unclassified, NSA. And if you think we're staying in the US, well, here's the Australian Essential 8, the Australian Top 35, the NSA Top 10, GCHQ, UK Cyber Essentials, ICOs, PCI, version 323130, uh, HIPAA, uh, the FFIEC, uh, examiner's handbook, uh, assessment tool, cybersecurity assessment tool, the CAT, COVID-5, AICPAs, the GAPS, IRS Pub 1075, SWIFT, uh, S, uh, Singapore, I believe that's what this is, uh, uh, Singapore's that, Saudi M uh, AMA from Saudi Arabia, the NERCs version 7, 6, and 5, and 4, 3, Cloud Security Alliance, SEC for uh, Amazon, FISMA Metrics, uh, ITIL, uh, sorry, ITIL, Nevada Gaming, uh, Massachusetts, New York Laws, Victorian, ANSI measures. So you can see there are a lot of the standards that we've been uh, able to collect from the students and our research. And then each one of these, we just, we go, we can go down the controls. If we want to see, for instance, secure configuration, here are the elements of, of 853 Rev 4, okay? So this matrix is, this spreadsheet, again, this is free. You can download it. It's a really, really uh, a valuable one. We can come over here and do spreadsheets and, and go through each of the control items if we really wanted to get down and dirty about it and then do the mappings for each control as we go down the line. So uh, this was something that, again, helps us uh, show how we've taken, you know, one of my big complaints about the ISO and high level frameworks is, yeah, it's real high level stuff, you know, uh, uh, kumbaya, we love each other, blah, blah, blah. But how do we actually, you know, implement that? And so this is a nice uh, way to demonstrate how we can put stuff together. So again, this is the master mappings a spreadsheet that's available for you uh, from auditscripts.com. And we'll come back to this guy uh, uh, shortly. Okay, so let's come back here to the to the slide deck. So that's what we're talking about in, in this phase here. We pick a control and, and map it to a standard, and that's the second bullet. And then later on, we will actually go uh, and, and show you some more stuff, right? So for instance, if we uh, 800, 171 for the US uh, uh, sites, um, this is the control on classified uh, uh, a, uh, uh, information and uh, you know 70 percent of the of the uh, 100 and some 110 control items numbers in 800-171 do map to a uh, critical control and so you know which ones have you done already what's the scope you know and I'm glad you asked that question Randy because I'm going to jump out of this session again I'm going to come over to the, uh, the web um, I'm going to go over, uh, basically, I'm already here. Uh, EDUCAUSE is the uh, professional organization for educational institutions. If you go out to Google and you, and you um, uh, Google for 800-171 compliance template EDUCAUSE, it'll point you, you'll, one of the links will point you to this site. And when you look here, uh, you, again, uh, the resources, you've got uh, slide decks and that. But you can look at the resources here. And this is another spreadsheet. And this one is more specific. Um, this one's more specific in that it, it, it um, uh, addresses 800-171, uh, each one of these items. So in this column A here, uh, uh, we start with 3.1.1. And then again, what type is it? Control text. Who's responsible? Here's the 853 mapping to the 800171, and the same with the 27002. But this column has the uh, relevant critical controls that some portion of these controls addresses this particular uh, requirement of 811. So controls 12, 13, 15, 16, and 17. Um, and then if you look in the next one and the access control, 
a category, you notice you see a bunch of these. And so we go, we can go down. This spreadsheet shows each of the control items of 800171. And then over here in this column, what we believe is a relevant critical security control. So if you're stuck with this and you have to do this type of um, this type of, of, uh, of audit, uh, you've got a mapping uh, with uh, this type of spreadsheet. Okay. So uh, again, this is another freebie uh, that's out there and, and you can uh, use it uh, uh, to help you uh, there. Okay. All right, so using the gap analysis, uh, you know, you want to you want to go through this. This is the um, uh, measurement uh, spreadsheet that's available from AuditScripts.com, uh, and uh, the, you answer a bunch of questions, and it will compute uh, uh, a maturity level score, um, policies complete, implemented, uh, controls one through five, all the controls implemented, all the controls are automated, and the results of your controls are reported to the business. And so you can see, you get sort of an overall. And this is this can be for your overall organization as a composite of everybody. It can be for a division. It can be for um, uh, uh, a local uh, working group. However you you break it down, uh, you can do this, and you generate a gap analysis, uh, as, as you see here. Okay. Um, and and so uh, you want to get that initial. Sorry, you want to get that initial one. And frankly, your initial one's going to suck. Okay, uh, and we know that. Uh, what we're trying to do is to get the first measure, and then as we iterate through the process, hopefully we start increasing our, our implementation uh, the scores uh, here. So gap analysis is a very critical thing. From an operational standpoint, this is going to take a lot of time. Uh, uh, to answer these questions takes a lot of time. You're going to get pushed. I keep hitting the button here, sorry. You're gonna get pushback uh, from your divisions, your department heads, this takes too much time, we gotta do this, uh, I don't have the people to do this, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is where you need the, the um, uh, push from management. Upper management says, um, this needs to be done and it needs to be done by this date. Uh, and uh, it's amazing what a deadline uh, will do for for uh, middle managers and upper managers. So this is very critical where you need the support of your upper management to uh, enforce that this be done by the appropriate business processes within your organization that you're measuring the gaps for. Okay. So this is sort of a little benchmark. Uh, benchmark. This is sort of a little uh, flowchart uh, of how we might approach uh, uh, from uh, the data to um, uh, uh, to a, a, a compliant uh, image. And there are a bunch of the controls that are, are addressed here. I will go through this, but generally you got to start with the data. Where's your sensitive data? What type of applications are, are using it? Are these applications secured? Of course, you're running it uh, perhaps on a server. What type of regulations are governing the data that you're, that you're looking at? Can I map these uh, regulations to a critical security control? And then from here, this is where we start building uh, the actual code and commands to configure it. We uh, look at the uh, CIS benchmarks, and I'll show you this mapping in a second, and then you create a security configuration script. And so at this point here, here I was using CUI as an example, but at this point, you've started off with installing the operating system, installing the operating system patches, installing the apps, the app patches, and then you have this uh, localization scripts, and then you run the security configuration scripts, which sets your security settings at a whatever level you, you deem appropriate. And now you have a base image uh, that you can use uh, for a different uh, particular class of, of server. Okay. Um, so the, the, the critical controls are kind of grouped into uh, three categories. Um, uh, and, and group one is the, uh, is the one that everybody should be doing. But for small uh, organizations, uh, for, for us, it'd be small schools, private schools, uh, uh, people where the, sometimes the IT staff is one person, sometimes it's two or three. And that's what you would use with the implementation group one. 
Um, a little bit uh, more, you, you move up to uh, group one and two, and then uh, if you've got uh, significant resources, or as I like to point out, significant motivation uh, from an audit report or something like that, then, uh, then you can do uh, address all three uh, of the controls. What are they? Well, the basic controls in that first set are, are six controls. Uh, uh, software and hardware inventory, which are controls one and two. Uh, vulnerability scanning, uh, that's three. Uh, controlling use of admin privileges, four. Uh, having a secure configuration, a uh, gold disk, if you will, for the different types of endpoint servers and, and uh, applications, uh, that's control five. And then logging for the whole mess. So those at a, at a minimum, regardless of the size of your organization, those are where you might want to start. And that's what we've, we did, uh, we're doing here at Virginia Tech. Um, I realized uh, uh, after a while that uh, biting off all 20 was too much to do. We're focusing on, on uh, the basics. And we are also focusing on a couple here, for instance, uh, a boundary defense control 12, but more importantly, data protection. That's one of the ones that, that we want to focus on as well. And then perhaps uh, account monitoring and control. But really data protection is the one that as a CISO, that's the one that's going to cause me the most uh, headache uh, there. Okay, so and this diagram comes from the CIS uh, benchmark document itself. So, quick review: there are proven defenses, actual attacks. Uh, you need to be able to uh, 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 know how to attack a site for you to be able to defend it, and it helps us prioritize uh, where to start because uh, we could start in 90,000 to 100,000 different places, and here we're starting with 20. There is a certain alert loop that, that shows up in all of the controls. Uh, you have some sort of analytics engine, a SIM or something like that. Uh, it could be a trouble ticket system like ServiceNow. Uh, you have a SIM that collects the, the data. You've got um, uh, your help desk people and your SOC people that, that kind of form this alert loop. Um, I'm gonna, we blow this up um, from the other diagrams I'm gonna show you. Uh, just to kind of give you the idea of what the components are there. Security office, SOC might be over here, help desk might be over here. As you look at each of these diagrams, you should be asking yourself, who in my organization, which group in my organization is the one that's responsible for this particular thing? So for example, uh, inventory and control of hardware uh, assets, okay? Now, here's the alert loop that I just showed you, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time uh, in that, in this particular thing, because we got that there. But there are a number of, of things. If this is your organizational network, the computing systems, you, do you have some sort of passive device uh, discovery tool? Do you have some sort of active scanning tool that you run on, on, on a periodic basis? What type of, of um, network uh, logins do you have? Uh, is it two-factor or does it uh, a personal digital certificates? Does it require uh, a PKI uh, uh, there? Do you put this in who has the databases? How many of these databases are out there and how often are they maintained? So for each of these, who in your, who in your office and your organization runs this? So for example, uh, my office, the, the um, uh, IT security office, we run an active scanner against all machines in our, uh, we have two class Bs. We have an active scanner tool that we run, can scan the two class Bs, uh, 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 directed scans, not a general full scan, but it can do uh, 50 ports uh, of interest uh, of two class Bs in about five minutes. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second. That's active discovery. Uh, passive discovery, there's a tool that's run by our network management group. Uh, the asset inventory database, there are a couple of those. We, we have one uh, for our active discovery scan. Uh, network group has one. Uh, we have our SIM group, the login, out, uh, login group, a central logging service. They have their own. Who maintains network authentication, identity management, uh, perhaps maybe your networking group? Your, uh, do you have a PKI group or is that outsourced? So again, as you look at each of these, who in your organization is managing those, those devices there, okay? So one of the big difficulties that we ran into with Control One was kind of funny because when I asked the, the SAN students in the classes that I teach, I said, well, you know, do you know, do you have a IP address and MAC address? Oh yes, we do. Uh, you know, well, what do you use to collect that? Well, we use, uh, 
you know, Cisco Clean Access or Aruba ClearPath or some some sort of network logging tool. I said, well, that's really good. I, that's that's nice. But but you're working with an address that has been created and generated by your networking group, and so you need to you need to drill down. And yes, I got a login name, Mark Cheney. I got an I, I got a MAC address for my device. I have an IP address that was assigned to me. But you need to find out how that IP address is generated. Is it a static or wired address? Uh, you know, is it uh, hardwired or wireless? Let's say if it's if it's wired, is it statically assigned? And if it's statically assigned, how is that address generated? Do you have are your networks segmented uh, subnets? Uh, by subnets, uh, what, how, you know, is it stroke, is it normal subnets, stroke eight, stroke 16s, or is it weirdo, uh, you know, strokes like stroke 13s or 16s or, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, and that's for static. If it's DHCP, how is the device registered? Well, that might be clean access, but what are your lease times? How, how long do you, does your hardware asset hold that lease? And then, of course, who's registered? Now, this is very important, especially with lease times in DHCP, because it's not just being able to identify your hardware inventory today at this point, four o'clock Eastern time. You may get an alert, or you may get an email from uh, me, for instance, that says, "Hey, we detected an attack from an IP address in your network that happened a week ago, or maybe two weeks ago, or in some cases." you know, two or three weeks ago. Uh, my favorite one is when you deal with federal law enforcement, sometimes they'll come back and they'll go, well, this hit you six months ago. You know, well, thanks for telling me now. But my point is, is that if you go back, and uh, I mean, some organizations that I've talked to, their lease times are four hours. So just to go back two or three days, you have to have those logs to show, you know, who had that, that IP address at that particular time. So this is something that you really need to consider. And usually these lease times are determined uh, mostly by your networking group. Uh, but again, maybe the security office, you need to understand how that, that works, okay? On the wireless side of things, well, that's nice. We got you know something like Radius, Aruba, Management Console, uh, network address translation um, for all of the IP addresses. But more importantly, your networking group may use port address translation where uh, what shows up in a log is the same IP address, but it's a different session assigned to a different port. So you need to understand if your networking group is using port address translation, and also when are they using it? Is it always on certain days? Is it when the, the load is too, uh, too much or too high? What's the trigger point that gets you to go that way? So this is kind of a, a complicated, it's not as straightforward as everybody thinks it is. So let me uh, jump out of this uh, real quick. I'm going to bounce over to uh, a website. I want to show you an example of a tool that, that we wrote it's called uh, NetScan. Uh, we we uh, scan both of our class Bs, and literally we count the number of servers that we find on our network. We also make a determination as to whether this um, uh, a particular asset is uh, internet addressable or not, okay? It's important that you do this from not only internally, but that you do it from an external source. Uh, we have a cooperative arrangement with another organization uh, that lets us run the stuff, or you can go and use it from the cloud. However you do it, you wanna make sure you do this uh, uh, from an internal machine as well as, as, well as from uh, uh, somebody outside your organization. Now, just as a very quick example, I mean, yes, if I click on these, I could get the IP addresses, but I want to uh, point your attention here to uh, uh, your web servers. You'll notice that as of this morning, uh, we had uh, 3,140 web servers. And when, I, when we first ran the script, the script of, oh, I don't know, almost a decade ago, I kind of freaked out. I was like, what are we doing with so many, you know, we're only supposed to have maybe 200 at most uh, uh, authorized web servers. Um, and as we started to drill down, that's when we discovered, um, you know, things like printers and scanners and surveillance cameras and door locks and time clocks that, that all have built-in web servers in them. And so that you have to take into account now your IoT uh, devices. 
as part of your hardware inventory. As another example, a little further down here, you'll notice that we have uh, 397 SMTP servers, right? Those are email servers. What are we doing with almost 400 email servers? Well, turns out that, you know, I mean, we use Exchange, we use Google uh, apps, you know, so, but it turns out that, you know, a lot of these um, scanners have that scan to email option. And you know what? Uh, that's an email server that counts. So doing this type of inventory is very, very critical uh, for you to use. And, and you know, obviously we look for database engines and things like that. Uh, I can't protect all 165,000 nodes that are on our, our network, but I can protect the 10 or 20 that are, are critical. Okay. So this is a great script. I would, I would highly recommend that you uh, use it. And where, where can I get it? Um, where I can get it is from, and I'm going to put this in the chat window here. Uh, so from a github.com uh, slash uh, W8RBT. Uh, Brad Tilly is uh, my senior security architect. This is his uh, GitHub site. And uh, I, I'd like to brag on him. And I'll probably, if he's listening on this webcast, he's going to go, oh, geez, here he goes. But he's very, very sharp, very, very uh, uh, technical minded. And when he sees a problem, he writes a tool to solve it. So if you come to the GitHub site here, you'll see right here is the NetScan uh, code. Uh, all the source codes provided, uh, you can take it. It'll, t it'll show you how to modify the ports that are being scanned. And um, again, it's a it's an open source freeware thing. Use at your own risk. This gives you uh, this is the this is the code uh, here. This port scanner that generates this type of report puts it in the database, and and you can come back and look at it. Okay. All right. So let's get back here. We've got a couple more things to talk about. Control two, uh, which is inventory of software. Uh, perhaps uh, those of you that are are in a central Active Directory. Uh, this is might be easier to control but once again who in your organization manages the software inventory who maintains the database where are the databases and then are you using any type of software whitelisting who inside your organization manages each of these components because these are the people that you're going to need to talk to in order to uh, 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 do your gap analysis uh, for this okay now uh, this is a problem because one of the things that we find out, obviously this works for uh, 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 machines that are owned by the organization. In the BYOD world, uh, we, we don't have any real control as to what we can, what's out there. I can say this agent must be on your machine to use to uh, connect to our network, but as far as what type of gaming software you got there or whatever, that's, that's, uh, that's outside of my scope, the scope of my authority. But the real driving question for this is, how long does it take to install software needed by a business unit? And again, when we teach these classes, uh, the, the, the controls classes, SANS, some of the SANS students say, oh, uh, uh, forever. <laughs> Six months is usually the average answer that I hear. Well, that's, that's not going to cut it. And this is going to be one of those things where your users are really going to kind of mess up this particular control if it takes too long to install the software that they need. Okay. Well, if the rest of the internet is scanning you for vulnerabilities, why aren't you? <laughs> so that's what control three is, is basically you want to, you want to scan uh, your, your uh, critical assets for sure. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, um, um, moderate risk assets, uh, but you want want to run vulnerability scans, you want to see, uh, this is a two-way street. Number one, you want to run a, a, a scan, I don't care, uh, Nessus, Tenable, Rapid7, whatever. Um, you want to run it against the uh, 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 your servers because you want to see if there are any vulnerabilities that are out there. At the same time, on the server side, the target side, you want to see what, what uh, logs your machines generate when it's being scanned with a vulnerability server because that will help you determine uh, uh, you know, what type of scan is being done uh, and perhaps you aren't logging stuff that you should be. And, and so uh, on both ends of the, of the, of the, the pipe, if you will, uh, you wanna make sure that you do this. 
In my office, for instance, we do the vulnerability scanning of critical assets, but we also allow local systems to do their own scans. They can do those as often as they want. All right, with control four, uh, admin privileges, uh, um, this is one of those things. I'm not a big fan of admin privileges, uh, uh, controlling the use of them, and let me qualify it before you start pounding on the keyboards. Uh, if someone wants admin privilege, then they need to go through some training. Uh, I was talking with a, a science professor one time, and he was uh, reading me the Riot Act because his IT guy wouldn't give him admin access for his uh, desktop, and he needed it because he needed to put all the software on there. And I, I said, you know, well, yeah, you can get it, and you have to do all this training. And he kind of was starting to read me the Riot Act, and I said, hey, look. I know you've got a $700,000 piece of equipment in your lab. You're, you're not going to let me just walk up to it and start punching buttons and putting test tubes in it because I know how to use a computer. You're going to give me some sort of training. And, and, he, and he said, oh, okay. But that's my soapbox. Again, as you look at these, who in your organization that makes that determination uh, of who gets uh, 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 account management? Is it a centralized unit or is it a unit that's closer to the actual business uh, unit itself? Okay. And who manages uh, your multi-factor? So uh, identity management groups might, might uh, determine your privileges and your middleware group might be doing the multi-factor authentication support. Okay. So again, as you look at these uh, uh, circles, who in your organization does those? Uh, this one I like, this is what I call the, you must be this tall to play in our network uh, one. And, and I'm going to spend a little time on this one because this is something uh, that I, I think is important uh, to do. Okay, you start off with a sort of, sort of baseline image, a gold image, you know, whatever it is. Um, uh, so, um, sorry, I'm just bouncing here for a second. Um, so you want to you wanna be able to, to uh, uh, do this. So hold this thought. I'm going to come back to this uh, a slide uh, in a second. I want to go through the other ones first and then show you a, a roadmap that I think uh, you might find uh, useful. Okay. Number six, and again, these are the six that are in the basic uh, set of, of, of controls. So uh, uh, again, having all your machines and all your devices on the time sync, uh, network time protocol, and what are you logging? Do you have a log standard that says what needs to be logged? Okay, and we're going to get back to this guy in just a second. Uh, one that we picked was border, but the border has changed. And really, what I'm talking about here is these are my numbers. Um, you know, when I first started IT, we had uh, mainframe days. We had uh, you know hardwired terminals and giant mainframes. Uh, everything was static. They weren't going to move. If they moved, it was an earthquake or or something that was going to do that. Then we had uh, and, uh, laptops and desktops where the endpoints became mobile, but the, the mainframes, the servers were still static. And now with cloud, containers, serverless apps, we are both ends of the spectrum. Not only are mobile, but they may not even be inside your network. And so how do we, how do we deal with that? Okay. And that complicates this boundary defense uh, 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 system here. To me, this is one of the reasons why we have to push some of this stuff to the endpoints. Okay, uh, and then again, how are addresses assigned? Uh, Two-factor and and these types of things are components. Who inside the organization does that? Right, and then we get to data protection. For me, this is one that we want to look at: data inventory classification. Uh, you know, what type of data loss, but First off, you got to classify it. Secondly, you have to find it. And third, you have to decide what to do with it. Do I keep it and therefore encrypt it, or do I uh, uh, delete it because I don't need it anymore? Right. So here we have the CIS benchmarks. And, and uh, um, so let me give you a, a sort of a, how do I get to there from here, right? So uh, let's look at some policy stuff and standards very quickly. This is it.vt.edu. I'm going to put this in the chat window here. Uh, so it.vt.edu. And under here, under resources, we have policies and standards. 
And on the, uh, so when we get to that page, I'm gonna come down here to the security and data protection. Here are the different uh, uh, policies. Uh, this is the one for uh, the policy that drives for uh, uh, control five, the secure configuration of devices. These are all public domain, by the way, so you can download them. But what I wanted to show here is the scope, okay? We do not have a, a mobile device strategy uh, a policy because we called it here an information technology resource and service. And that covers anything that connects to the net. That covers IoT, that covers devices and things like that. We have a set of procedures, very high level procedures, maintain the operating system and application software with appropriate patches, you know, and access controls. That's great. These are nice and high level, but I need rubber meets the road, okay? So let's move down just a bit. Down here in the standard section, we're in the security data protection. Down here in the standard section, we have a document that's minimum security standards. And, and uh, I'll tell you right off the bat, uh, we got this uh, from Stanford University. And so the idea here is we, we classify the, the um, uh, uh, severity of the, the endpoints by the data that's stored in them. If it is a low risk data, that means it's storing low risk, uh, it's a low risk endpoint. If it's storing low risk data, and these are the seven minimum items that have to be done. And if basically, regardless of what the uh, cl data classification is that's being stored on that machine, it's got to have these seven things, patching, whole disk encryption, malware protection, backup, inventory, equipment disposal, and uh, uh, credential access, password rules, and things like that. Then if it's high risk data, uh, patching system, big fix, uh, Kaseya, whatever, uh, whatever the rules are uh, for the standards or laws or regulations that govern that high risk data. And here we have a log requirement that says you have to forward it, your logs to a central server. This is for endpoints, okay? We have similar for servers, okay? And so here, low risk servers, patching inventory, host based firewalls need to be enabled, credential access, two factor authentication for interactive user and logins, and you have to have a, a surplus property thing. For anything other than low risk data, we have a training for sysadmins, malware protection. These again are high level of requirements, okay? And then something similar for applications. So how do we, how do we take this? So for instance, if it's a host based firewall, then perhaps what I would do is um, I would pull out, okay, it's a Linux, it's a Debian Linux server. So I'm gonna get the, the Debian Linux um, um, uh, uh, benchmark and I'm gonna look up the actual Debian Linux commands to uh, uh, implement uh, the host base firewall, okay? And so uh, from here, uh, uh, you know, and again, this is from the CI security website. Uh, and and uh, maybe I want to, you know, uh, do this benchmark, okay? And so where we are here is we have the CIS benchmark, and now we're getting ready to build our configuration script, right? So here's a page from, uh, uh, I think this is the Ubuntu uh, 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 Linux uh, security benchmark, okay? And here's, uh, here's a requirement. So you remember in the previous... Uh, uh, security standards document, it might be something like this. Ensure your permissions on Etsy, MOTD are configured. Well, how do I actually do that? Well, in this shaded box of the benchmark, here are the actual commands that you would do to do that. Okay. Uh, if you're running it as an audit or if you're running it as a creating, uh, sorry, uh, creating it. And literally, I cut these commands out of this document and I paste them into a, a config file a text file. And I go through each of the sections in this benchmark. And if the answer is yes, I need those commands, I cut those commands out of the benchmark, I paste them into this text file. And eventually when I go through it once, remember the first one's gonna be painful, it's gonna take a long time to do. But it's, you know, it's the first chip, right? The first chip always costs $3 million. 
and all the other chips cost a nickel. All right. So I go through this, and at the end, I have this configuration script. And now I can run that configuration script, and that change sets all my settings to meet whatever the security standards were, uh, requirements were there. Okay. And I come up with something that, in this example, I was picking on C, uh, control on classified information. But now I have an image that is uh, uh, meets the control requirements and meets the regulatory requirements. And then, uh, you know, to the best of its ability, it's not going to be 100%, uh, obviously. And then that's what I would use to install for any servers that handle, for instance, high risk data. Okay. So mapping it, uh, I always like to map this to uh, the, the critical controls um, to uh, 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 zero trust networks. I, this is the other buzzword that, that people like to use. Um, but the, the controls here that are shown in green, uh, one, two, uh, five, six, eight, uh, 12, uh, uh, these are, are what the uh, um, what, uh, zero trust networks uh, address uh, using this uh, wireless access uh, control uh, application software security uh, uh, and access account monitoring and control. Okay. So basically, um, uh, you know, you've got this bridge between the, the frameworks, uh, uh, the industry and local standards and, and start with the basic set. So before I, I open it up for questions here, uh, let me just quickly review uh, some of the places that I visited uh, so that you can uh, uh, make sure we got it. So uh, first off, uh, again, th what, I, what you're seeing here, this is the it.vt.edu website. This is our central IT. This is where we have our policies and standards. Uh, one thing I, I, I wanna show you is our, our risk classifications. Uh, and basically what we have here, and let me uh, blow this puppy up. Oh, sorry. Um, um, da, 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 here we go. So what, we, what we've done here is low risk systems are, uh, you know, not moderate or high risk. So let's go to high risk. High risk systems are uh, data and systems are classified as high risk if the protection of the data is required by law and uh, or regulation and Virginia Tech is required to self-report to the government or provide notice or the loss of confidentiality. So basically any data that's covered by a uh, law regulation and requires us to self-report uh, uh, to someone, uh, that's what we ca call high risk data. Okay, so this is the data classification thing. And if we come back to the standards, okay, if we come back to the, the uh, data standards, uh, that's this document uh, here. And um, uh, so what we did in this case here is um, here, uh, let me scroll up just a little bit. So let me come back up here to the beginning. So here we have uh, security standards for endpoints, and we define them to be any laptop, desktop, or mobile device. For patching, not only do we have the check mark, but here we show you the critical security control that we believe addresses this point, okay? And then what I would do is now I'm looking at patching. How do I set up my machine to do patching? That's where I would go to the CIS benchmark and get the actual command, okay? So we have this for, for um, uh, endpoints, low, medium, or high risk endpoints. We have it for servers, and we have it for applications, okay? The other thing that we have from a standard side here is the standard for uh, technology logging. And this is our logging standard. This basically tells us what we expect uh, people to log, okay? And basically it, it's any logs that can answer these questions, right? Okay, so uh, again, all of these things that I just showed you, they're out on the web, on our websites. Uh, you can download them, uh, feel free to change them. 
I, I do want to thank Stanford University for allowing us to uh, to uh, uh, copy their their formats and and modify them for our our, our use. Uh, Michael Duff at, at Stanford, uh, uh, thanks again for letting us do this. Uh, and I guess uh, Debbie, I'll, I'll just open it up for any questions that might be out there. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Randy. And we do have some questions. Um, here's one. Is it possible to use the 20 critical security controls to help address securing connected medical devices? So, um, uh, yes, it is. Uh, uh, but um, it's going to be more so um, right off the top of my head, and, and we're, we're struggling with this problem uh, at the moment. If a device has an IP address, then uh, you should be able to uh, use control one to uh, build an inventory of those devices. Um, so that's the first thing. It, 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 if it get, does it have, it does the device, you know, I don't know, the stapler, medical stapler, does it have its own IP address? If it does, it, you should be able to uh, build an a inventory database that has information about that device. If, it, if it's not, that it's the controller that's got that IP address, um, then, you know, well, uh, you, at least you know where that controller lives. Uh, the hard part in, that we're finding in this is who's responsible for it? Who's the person that if there is a problem, who, who do we, who do we uh, uh, you know, uh, contact? Now, controls two, software inventory, it's going to be difficult to see what's inside those, those devices. Uh, um, control three, vulnerability uh, scanning. You can certainly do that. I would do that in a test environment, not in a lab environment. But you do want to know if, if, uh, if a vulnerability scan is capable of disabling a medical device, that introduces a whole different threat vector uh, uh, there. So you can use control three uh, for that. Admin privileges and, and secure configurations, controls four and five, I don't think you're going to be able to do much with those uh, as far as IoT goes, but uh, you can certainly, uh, you know, go out there and, and check into it. Now, having said this, uh, in the, uh, let me see, in the CIS uh, uh, benchmark uh, website, uh, there are what we call uh, companion guides, if I remember right. Let's see, I'm just searching here. Um, so if, if you go to cisecurity.org and, uh, and then you search for companion guides, you'll find this, this, um, uh, uh, this companion guide for the 20 critical controls. And IoT is one of the companion guide documents that's in there. Um, uh, uh, and so, um, um, yeah, there it's, uh, it probably would be, yeah, I remember because I remember seeing one for for uh, um, for IoT, but you can certainly get these companion guides, and they can help you uh, figure out which controls you can map. Okay. What's another one? Great. Thank you, Randy. Another question: What controls are critical for vulnerability management? Um, the first uh, first six. <laughs> um, you have to know where where uh, where the device is that you're scanning and who's responsible for it. You need to know what software is running on it. Uh, so that's your software inventory. Uh, admin privileges, um, maybe not that much, um, uh, but certainly uh, Control 5, the secure configuration ones, you, you want to have uh, an idea of what the baseline is supposed to be. Uh, control 7, which is web apps, uh, 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 web browsers and that, that would be another control uh, that, that a vulnerability scanner would touch. Certainly boundary defense um, would be another one. Uh, but uh, basically uh, most of the controls would be uh, affected, but I would start, uh, I would start with the first, uh, uh, the ones that I just mentioned, plus uh, uh, the, uh, the web one uh, and, and application software security. Uh, uh, if you've got a, a, a specialized um, vulnerability scanner, like a, a web app vulnerability scanner, Akinetics or Web Inspect or something like that. Okay, great. And that does take us to the end of the hour. 
Thank you so much, Randy, for your great presentation. To our audience, we greatly appreciate your listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. A quick note, you can find your CEUs for this or any completed webcast by logging into your SANS portal account. Navigate to your account dashboard, then click My Webcasts. You can then download your CEU on the right-hand side of the page. Until next time, take care. We hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.